Section 20.6, Selection Rules and Intensities. The electronic transition probability is proportional to the squared modulus of the transition dipole moment, mu fi with an arrow. So this arrow indicates this transition dipole moment is a vector. It contains x, y, and z components. I is the initial electronic state. F is the final electronic state. So we have this transition probability proportional to the squared modulus of this vector. And this vector, the transition dipole moment vector, can be evaluated using this integral. So psi sub i is the wave function of the initial state. Psi sub f is the wave function of the final electronic state. This star is complex conjugate. So we're talking about the complex conjugate of the wave function of the final electronic state. And this mu is the dipole moment of the transition metal complex. However, we can also expand this mu to be the initial electrical dipole moment plus the change of the electric dipole moment. The initial electric dipole moment is a constant. And then we just need to evaluate the integral of this psi f star times psi i times that constant electric dipole moment for the first part. That's always zero. Because in quantum mechanics, we learned that uh, this different electronic states with different energies are always orthogonal to each other. So that means the integral of psi i and psi f star is always zero. But there's a second part. Again, this mu is the initial electric dipole moment plus the change. And then the integral of this psi f star times the change of the electric dipole moment times the initial wave function is not always zero. We have to do the uh, integration to determine whether this is zero or not. And then for simplicity, we often decompose uh, this factor into the x, y, z components. And we'll look at the electric dipole moment change in these three directions. So that's why we have this kind of equations here. And again, the squared modulus of the transition dipole moment can be easily computed given the three components in the three dimensions. So what we do is we just need to evaluate these three components and see if any one of the three is non-zero. If any one of the three is non-zero, well, this is non-zero, and it's positive. That means the transition probability is positive. The transition is allowed. But when all three components in the three dimensions are all zero, and then we say, well, this is a forbidden electronic transition. It's not going to happen. So we'll look at two different selection rules. The first rule is the spin selection rule. Uh, this is very important because in quantum mechanics, we learned that the alpha spin function and beta spin function of electrons are orthogonal to each other. Uh, what does that mean? That means the integral of alpha star beta d, d omega is zero. The integral of beta star alpha is also zero. And now if we look at the initial electronic state, the final electronic state, they both contain the spin functions. If they contain different spin functions, one alpha, one beta, we can separate the integral of the spin functions from the integral of spatial functions. Well, this is because this mu z does not contain any spin function. So really, this integral can be expressed as the product of the spatial integral 
and the integral of the spin function. And if we have the opposite spins in the initial and final states, the integral of alpha star times beta is zero. The integral of beta star times alpha is zero. So either way, you'll get a zero integral of the spin functions. Either way, you will have a zero transition time moment and zero transition probability. So this is why when a transition is spin forbidden, the transition has either a zero intensity or extremely low intensity. And this is the spin selection rule. So again, when the initial and final states have different spin states, uh, that means there's a change in the electron spin quantum number. In that case, uh, this transition is spin forbidden. And you can easily tell this transition dipole moment is strictly zero. Uh, spin forbidden transitions can still occur, uh, but the intensity is going to be very low. So how can this occur? Well, sometimes the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum can be coupled. So that's one. Two, uh, if this transition metal complex has surrounding molecules, uh, there may be spin exchange uh, between this transition metal uh, complex and the surrounding molecules. So these two reasons uh, may allow some spin forbidden transitions to occur, but still the intensity is very low. Uh, when delta S is zero, that means there's no electron spin flip. Then the electronic transition is spin allowed. But still, we need to look at the spatial integral. So that's the second rule, the Laporte selection rule. Uh, we have to look at a molecule in a um, octahedral environment first, because in a octahedral transition metal complex, if all six ligands are identical to each other, and then this complex belongs to the OH point group. And in the OH point group, we know there's a inversion symmetry element. And then we can assign the G or U symmetry label to the electronic state. We can also assign the G or U symmetry label to the electric dipole moment. So if you look at the uh, electric dipole moment mu, it has a anti-symmetric uh, property with respect to the inversion center. So I'll let you imagine, when you have a OH point group, you can draw an arrow that passes through the inversion center. And then this vector is anti-symmetric with respect to the inversion center. Because if you do an inversion, the direction of the vector changes to its opposite direction. And it's true in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. So again, this electric dipole moment of the transition metal complex has a U symmetry. Now what about the initial and final electronic states? Uh, well, we don't know. We don't know. So it's possible for this size sub i or size sub f with a U symmetry or G symmetry. When both size sub i and size sub f are G symmetry or U symmetry, the product of one, two, three, three terms 
will be U symmetry. Why is that? Well, this is because G times U is U. U times G is still U. G times G is G. U times U is G. Uh, you may replace G and U with positive 1 and negative 1. And then you'll re realize that G times G, of course, positive 1 times positive 1 is 1. U times U is G because negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. G times U is 1 times negative 1. Of course, the result is U. U times G is U. All right? So if size of I and size sub f have the same symmetry, either both g symmetry or both u symmetry. This transition is forbidden because when you have both u symmetry or both g symmetry, uh, size sub i times size sub f will be g symmetry, and then this electric dipole moment has a u symmetry. So. In the end, g times u is u. You are integrating a u function, a anti-symmetric function. The integral of a anti-symmetric function from negative infinity to positive infinity is always zero in all three directions, in the x direction, in the y direction, in the z direction. The three components are all zero. Well, this is because if we look at the x component, let's try to integrate a u function in the x direction. And then on the negative side, you have integral. On the positive side, you have another integral. Both integrals are with respect to the x variable. They have the same magnitude, but the opposite signs. So the integral value on the negative side cancels the integral value on the positive side. So that's why uh, in a transition metal complex, in a octahedral environment, the G to G transition is forbidden, U to U transition is forbidden. Only G to U or U to G transitions are allowed. So that means, well, the wave function must change its symmetry. So again, over here, you're looking at G to G transition. So this is initial, this is final G to G transition. Okay, this is forbidden because in the middle, you have the electric dipole moment with a U symmetry. Right, so the product is U and the integral of this u function is zero because the integral on the left hand side and the integral on the right hand side cancel completely same here if you go from u symmetry to u symmetry the resulting transition dipole moment is exactly zero and this is forbidden uh, but still we are able to observe uh, some of those forbidden transitions. We observe G2G transitions, U2U transitions, uh, even for a octahedral transition metal complex with six identical ligands. And why is that? Well, uh, at the room temperature or non-zero temperature, there are vibrational motions so those vibrational motions of the ligands or the motion between the metal and the ligands distort the octahedral symmetry. So it's no longer a perfect inversion center. And the wave functions of the electronic states are no longer perfectly G or U symmetry. So, over here, we can no longer assume these three components are perfectly G or U. That means it's possible to observe these 
so-called Laporte forbidden transitions. As long as the temperature is non-zero, and then there are vibrations being coupled with the electronic transition. Uh, now let's look at this table of the intensities of spectroscopic bands in 3D transition metal complexes. Uh, this epsilon is the extinction coefficient. Uh, when you have spin forbidden transition, epsilon is really, really small. And then we have Laporte forbidden transition versus Laporte allowed transition. If it's Laporte forbidden transition, well, we have between 20 to 100. Laporte allowed, 250. So there's a big difference between Laporte forbidden, Laporte allowed. All right? And then we have this charge transfer transition with a huge epsilon only because this kind of transition involves a significant change in the electric dipole moment of the transition metal complex due to the electron flow from the ligands to the metal or from the metal to the ligands.